The Lord be with you. Welcome this morning to our video matins. This Sunday is ex Audi. It's the last uh, Sunday in this Easter season, the Sunday after the Ascension. Uh, this is the Sunday when our Lord tells us uh, about the persecution that will come uh, from, from outside and also from inside the church. Um, and, and in telling us this, uh, he's, he's letting us know so that we don't fall away. And so... Um, this, this Sunday is about encouragement in the faith to continue, even in the face of persecution and in dealing with um, all of the suffering that goes along with life in this world. As before, everything you're going to need for worship will show up on your screen. Uh, we begin with the opening hymn.
Let us 
A reading from Ezekiel, chapter 36. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my just decrees. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from 1 Peter, chapter 4. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from John, chapter 15 and 16. Jesus said, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things, because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Holy Spirit, give to the Lord all 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus tells his disciples what will happen to them. They will be put out of the synagogues, removed from their families and friends. They will be tortured and killed in shameful ways. They will be despised like they were child molesters. Their killers will be made into heroes for ridding the world of their like. Jesus did not warn them so that they could avoid it. He only told them so that when it came, they wouldn't fall away. They will follow our Lord and die as he died. As he prayed to his father in Gethsemane, they will pray, and they're going to receive the same answer that Jesus did. There is no getting out of their sorrow or martyrdom. If we measure this the way the world measures this, it sounds horrible. But not if we measure in the ways of God. The apostles get the Holy Spirit. The Spirit bears witness of Christ to them, and then he also bears witness of Christ in and through them. They become ambassadors for Christ, envoys of heaven, heralds of good news. And they are put out of the synagogues. But they gain an enduring country and city, an eternal family that is bound together by water that is thicker than blood. The fear of the Jews is replaced with the fear of the Lord. The love of life and health and reputation is replaced with the love of God and of his law, which does not pass away. The avoidance of pain and embarrassment is replaced with the avoidance of sin and an embracing of humility. And the apostles gain peace that passes all understanding, love that does not fail, and faith that overcomes hell itself. They were insulted for the name of Christ, but they were blessed by the spirit of glory and God was and remains upon them. Now, for all of that, we here and now might be thankful that we're not apostles. After all, we might be spared martyrdom, but we won't be spared suffering. We can't. Even though we're not apostles, we still follow Christ and we have our own crosses to bear. The student is not above his teacher. So this should be a surprise to none of us. You have all had plenty of sorrow. And we are, to a man, hyper aware of our own tribulations and our own lack and of every small and large deprivation or of any insult or any slight that we have ever suffered. We catalog them. We keep record of them. That way, if anyone says we haven't suffered, we'll say, let me tell you how I've suffered. What we don't realize is that we are not unique. There's this kind of modern way of thinking about suffering where we think that if we can somehow make ourselves the bigger victim than the other guy, well, then somehow we'll win. There is a kind of self-righteousness that creeps into our suffering. We are tempted to indulge in a fantasy where we are the heroes. We like to imagine that we have fought hard in life for the truth and have suffered dearly for it. And we think that other people, if they happen to be successful, well, they were just lucky. Or there was something unfair about how they got where they are. And if they're not successful, well, they're just lazy. 
We think that almost everyone is ignorant of the great battle that rages all around them and of how important we are. Repent. Suffering waxes and wanes over the whole course of a lifetime. Sometimes it's greater and sometimes it's less. Some of it is public, some of it very public. But most of it, and typically the worst of it, is private. So it is possible at any moment that you are suffering more than someone else. But nothing has befallen you that is not common to man. If in a particular moment you are suffering more, remember that time when you weren't. Remember in that moment how uncaring, how discompassionate, and deliberately ignorant you were about your neighbors. And remember also that people tend to suffer the worst of their sorrows in secret. Remember and repent. We pray that none of us are tortured and martyred. We pray that none of us would be humiliated before the world. We pray that our children would not be destroyed. But we do that knowing that none of us is going to get out of this world alive. None of us can take our stuff with us. And none of us can ensure a future for our children or for our beloved institutions. No one really ages gracefully. The only reason that death is sometimes kind of a kindness is because it is always torturous and evil. More painful than death, really, is life. And even when life is free from physical violence, it's still full of all kinds of failures and regrets and pain, mistakes and sins, addictions and perversity, loneliness and hatred and scorn. And that's just what we do to ourselves. Life is also afflicted by the sins of others. Betrayals, disappointments, heartbreaks and frustration, abuse and neglect. All those things that shape our year but still don't make it into the Christmas letter. And there has not been a life yet lived that was free from that. Again, you know that about yourself. You're keenly aware of it. Sometimes you're almost obsessed with your own pain and circumstances. But remember that nothing has befallen you that is not common to man. Everyone is hurting over time just as deeply as you. Do not judge by outward appearances. Crosses are all custom made. We can't know, we don't know and we can't know what other people are enduring or have endured. In fact, we are not the hero. We are not worse off than our neighbors. We are not just unlucky or singled out for some cosmically significant event. Dear Christian, what you are, though, is baptized. I'm telling you this now so that you do not fall away or think that your sufferings are strange. You are baptized. And as one who is baptized, you know that means you're special to God and that he counts every hair on your head. He has died for you, ransomed you on purpose, deliberately. You, you are chosen. That doesn't mean you won the lottery. In fact, in this world, it means you get a cross and chastisements and you feel like an alien living in the place where you were born. But you are part of the family, the church. You're part of the family, and you engage in the business of our Father, the family business. And the family business is loving the people of the world, including 
and especially the highly flawed people who have hurt you. And yes, they really did hurt you, and that pain is real. But you, as a Christian, are called to look past the sins of your neighbor. You're called to look past the sins of your brother-in-law, who's always boasting about how busy he is, as though that makes him somehow better. You're called to look past your sister, who posts fake victories on Instagram. You're called to look past the friend who's always late and only ever talks about himself. You are called upon to endure vanity and insults and even stupidity from your brothers and sisters in Christ to think of and explain their motives and actions in the kindest way possible rather than thinking poorly of them. And you certainly are not to imagine yourself being greater than they are. You are called as a Christian to flee jealousy and covetousness. What that means is that we don't compare ourselves to others. Love one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And just like all of God's holy law, that catches us hard. It accuses us. It makes us squirm because we are jealous. We are covetous. We really do think that others have it better than we do. We really do think we deserve something for all the suffering that we've done that no one knows about. We do think that life isn't fair. And because we do think that, we repent. The law exposes our thinking not only as false, but actually evil. We thank God, actually, for exposing our sin, showing us our sin, so that we would know our need for a Savior and know what it looks like to live the life that he's called us to. We Christians actually want to know what's good so that we can do it. We want to be good as he is good. We want to love the way that he loves and the way that he's called us to love. This command, then, to stop comparing ourselves to others allows us, it shows us how to live the best and most satisfying life. It's what we were created for. Comparing yourselves to other people is bad for you, not just spiritually, but also psychologically, even physically. It's just not healthy. No sin is healthy or good for you. So when you think yourself superior to others, you harm them and you harm yourself. Good works are good for you and they're good for your neighbor. That's part of their goodness. It comes from the reality that God's law is itself good. In the end then, the life of faith is a life that is learning to measure in the ways of God and not of men or mere physicality. No, you're not an apostle, but you do have the Holy Spirit. You also are an ambassador for Christ, an envoy of heaven, a herald of good news. And yes, you do sometimes have to make judgments. Sometimes you do have to issue warnings. Loving your neighbor does not mean endorsing or tolerating your neighbor's sin, his self-destructive behavior that will lead him to destruction. After all, you are witnesses for Christ in this world. That witness starts with the reality that this world is not all that there is. There's a better way to live, and there's a need for repentance. You're also a witness to the fact, the message, that the forgiveness of Christ is for everyone. The love that covers a multitude of sins, the love that befriends a boorish braggart or suffers the insults of the tactless person so caught up in his own pain, he has no self-awareness. Even the love that doesn't yell at the idiot that doesn't know how to merge onto the loop. 
that kind of love shows the world that you are Christ's disciple. You have fiery trials. They are real, and they hurt. They're exhausting. We long to be rid of them. You love your family, yes, and your friends as yourself, but it's a struggle. You try not to lash out. You try not to seek vengeance or force pity when it's lacking, even as you strive to love your enemies. Dear Christian, that's hard. Maybe it's not as hard as being an apostle, but maybe it is. Because nothing has befallen you that is not common to man, and crosses are custom made. In any case, with the Spirit bestowed in holy baptism, you get the peace that surpasses all understanding. You get love that does not fail, and a faith that overcomes hell itself. So you might be insulted for Christ. You might be insulted for his name. You might be surrounded by imperfect people, maybe a lot of them. But when you love them, when you forgive them, when you have compassion upon them, even when they don't appreciate it, and even when they don't notice it, you are blessed, and the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Dear Christian, rejoice. Be glad. For this world is passing away. The Christ has not failed you. He went to his death with no second thoughts and no regrets. Why? You were worth it to him. He went to the cross with you in mind and you were worth it. And he keeps his promises. The life that he gives along with the crosses that he inflicts are not easy but they are good. You are being made good through them. And take heart. You will not fall away. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the Spirit of truth, whom you promised from the Father, for you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.